At the head of Book 2 of the Magus by John Fowles is a quotation by the Marquis de Sade from The Misfortunes of Virtue. This is an approximate translation of the quote. Displeased at the first crime, the monsters took him, then naked, lay him face down on a large table. They lit candles, they placed the image of our Savior at his head, and then dared to consume the kidneys. Unhappy at this most unfortunate and redoubtable of our mysteries. Chapter 10 It was a Sunday in late May, blue as a bird's wing. I climbed up the goat paths to the island's ridgeback, from where the green froth of the pine tops rolled two miles down to the coast. The sea stretched like a silk carpet across to the shadowy wall of mountains on the mainland to the west, a wall that reverberated away south fifty or sixty miles to the horizon, under the vast bell of the Empyrean. It was an azure world, stupendously pure, and as always, when I stood on the central ridge of the island and saw it before me, I forgot most of my troubles. I walked along the central ridge restwards, between the two vast views north and south, Lizards flashed up the pine trunks like living emerald necklaces. There was thyme and rosemary and other herbs, bushes with flowers like dandelions dipped in sky, a wild, lambent blue. After a while I came to a place where the ridge fell away south in a small, near-precipitous bluff. I always used to sit on the brink there to smoke a cigarette and survey the immense expanse of sea and mountains. Almost as soon as I sat down that Sunday, I saw that something in the view had changed. Below me, halfway along the south coast of the island, there was the bay with the three small cottages. From this bay, the coast ran on westwards in a series of low headlands and hidden coves. Immediately to the west of the bay, with the cottages, the ground rose steeply into a little cliff that ran inland some hundreds of yards, a crumbled and creviced reddish wall, as if it was some fortification for the solitary villa that lay on the headland beyond. All I knew of this house was that it belonged to a presumably well-to-do Athenian, who used it only in high summer. Because of an intervening rise in the pine forest, one could see no more than the flat roof of the place from the central ridge. But now a thin wisp of pale smoke curled up from the roof. It was no longer deserted. My first feeling was one of resentment, a Crusoe-like resentment, since the solitude of the south side of the island must now be spoilt, and I had come to feel possessive about it. It was my secret province, and no one else. I permitted the poor fishermen in the three cottages, no one else risen beyond peasanthood had any right to it. For all that I was curious, and I chose a path that I knew led down to a cove the other side of Borani, the name of the headland the villa stood on. The sea and a strip of bleached stones finally shone through the pines. I came to the edge of them, it was a large open cove, a stretch of shingle, the sea as clear as glass, walled by two headlands. On the left and steeper, the eastward one, Barani, lay the villa hidden in the trees, which grew more thickly there than anywhere else on the island. It was a beach I had been to before two or three times, and it gave, like many of the island beaches, the lovely illusion that one was the very first man that had ever stood on it, that had ever had eyes, that had ever existed, the very first man. There was no sign of anyone from the villa. I installed myself at the more open westward end of the beach. I swam, I ate my lunch of bread, olives, and zuzukakia, fragrant cold meatballs, and I saw no one. Sometime in the early afternoon I walked down the burning shingle to the villa end of the cove. There was a minute whitewashed chapel set back among the trees. Through a crack in the door I saw an overturned chair, an empty candle stand, 
and a row of naively painted icons on a small screen. A tarnished paper gilt cross was pinned on the door. On the back of it, someone had scrawled Agios Demetrios, St. James. I went back to the beach. It ended in a fall of rocks, which mounted rather forbiddingly into dense scrub and trees. For the first time, I noticed some barbed wire, 20 or 30 feet from the foot of this slope. The fence turned up into the trees, isolating the headland. An old woman could have got through the rusty strands without difficulty, but it was the first barbed wire I had seen on the island, and I didn't like it. It insulted the solitude. I was staring up at the hot, heavy slope of trees when I had the sensation that I was not alone. I was being looked at. I searched the trees in front of me. There was nothing. I walked a little nearer the rocks above which the wire fence ran through the scrub. A shock. Something gleamed behind the first rock. It was a blue rubber foot fin. Just beyond it, partially in the thin clear shadow of another rock, was the other fin and a towel. I looked round again, then moved the towel with my foot. A book had been left beneath. I recognized it at once by the cover design one of the commonest paperback anthologies of modern English verse, which I had myself in my room back at the school. It was so unexpected that I remained staring stupidly down with the idea that it was, in fact, my own copy, stolen. It was not mine. The owner had not written his or her name inside, but there were several little slips of plain white paper neatly cut. The first one I turned to marked a page where four lines had been underscored in red ink from Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be that you arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The last three lines had an additional mark vertically beside them. I looked up to the dense bank of trees again before I turned to the next little slip of paper. That and all the other slips were at pages where there were images or references concerning islands or the sea. There must have been about a dozen of them. Later that night I rediscovered a few passages in my own copy. Each in his little bed conceived of islands where love was innocent being far from cities. Those two lines from Odin had been marked, and the two intervening ones not. There were several, also discontinuous, from Ezra Pound. Come, or the stellar tide will slip away. Eastward avoid the hour of its decline. Now, for the needle trembles in my soul, mock not the flood of stars, the things to be. And this, who even dead yet hath his mind entire, this sound came in the dark, first must thou go the road to hell and to the bower of Ceres' daughter Proserpina, through overhanging dark, to see Tiresias. Eyeless that was a shade that is in hell, so full of knowing that the beefy men know less than he. Ere thou come to thy road's end, knowledge the shade of a shade, yet must thou sail after knowledge, knowing less than drugged beasts. The sun wind, the breeze that blows almost every summer day in the Aegean, sent little waves curling like lazy whips along the shingles. Nothing appeared, everything waited. For the second time that day, I felt like Robinson Crusoe. I put the book back beneath the towel and faced the hill in a rather self-conscious way. Convinced by now that I was indeed being watched, then bent down and picked up the towel and the book and put them on top of the rock with the fins, where they would be easier to find if someone came looking for them. Not out of kindness, but to justify my curiosity to the hidden eyes, the towel had a trace of feminine perfume on it, suntan oil. I went back to where my own clothes were and watched out of the corner of my eye along the beach. After a time, I withdrew to the shade of the pine trees behind the beach. The white spot on the road gleamed in the sun. I lay back and went to sleep. It can't have been for long, but when I woke up and looked down the beach, the things had gone. 
The girl, for I'd decided it was a girl, had done her retrieving unseen. I dressed and walked down to the place. The normal path back to the school was from the middle of the bay. At this end, I could see another small path that led up away from the beach where the wire turned. It was steep, and the undergrowth inside the fence was too dense to see through. Small pink heads of wild gladioli flopped out of the shadows, and some warbler in the thickest of the bushes reeled out a resonant, stuttering song. It must have been singing only a few feet from me, with a sobbing intensity like a nightingale, but much more brokenly. A warning or a luring bird, I couldn't decide, though it was difficult not to think of it as meaningful. It scolded, fluted, screeched, jug-jugged, entranced. Suddenly a bell sounded from some way beyond the undergrowth. The bird stopped singing and I climbed on. The bell sounded again, three times. It was evidently calling people to some meal, English tea, or perhaps a child was playing with it. After a while, the ground leveled out on the back of the headland, and the trees thinned a little, though the undergrowth kept on as thickly as ever. Then there was a gate, chained and painted, but the paint was peeling the chain rusty, and a well-worn way had been forced through the wire by the right-hand gatepost. A wide grassy track led along the headland, seawards and slightly downhill. It curved between the trees and revealed nothing of the house. I listened for a minute, but there was no sound of voices. Down the hill the bird began to sing again. Then I saw it. I went through the gap. It was two or three trees in, barely legible, roughly nailed high up the trunk of a pine. In the sort of position one sees, trespassers will be prosecuted notices in England. But this notice said in dull red letters on a white background, Sal la tante. It looked as if years ago it had been taken from some French railway station, some ancient student joke. Enamel had come off and cancerous patches of rusty metal showed through. At one end there were three or four of what looked like old bullet holes. It was Mitford's warning, Beware of the waiting room. I stood on the grassy track in two minds whether to go on to the house, caught between curiosity and fear of being snubbed. I guessed immediately that this was the villa of the collaborationist he had quarreled with, but I had pictured a shifty, rat-faced Greek Laval, rather than someone cultured enough to read, or have guests who could read, Eliot and Odin in the original. I stood so long that I became impatient with my indecision and forced myself to turn away. I went back through the gap and followed the track up toward the central ridge. It soon petered out into a goat path, but one that had been recently used. Because there were overturned stones that showed earth red among the sun-bleached grays. When I reached the central ridge, I looked back. From that particular point, the house was invisible but I knew where it lay. The sea and the mountains floated in the steady evening sunshine. It was all peace, elements and void, golden air and mute blue distances like a clod. And as I wound down the steep schoolward paths, the northern side of the island seemed depressed and banal in comparison. 